many people already joined. We would start with the introduction round, and if anybody is joining in that time, it shouldn't be a problem. And then we will take it from there. So welcome to the webinar about how to build your CI-CD pipeline on Snowflake with Data Vault Builder. And the event why we are here is that we are now new uh, technology partner on a select level with Snowflake from Data Vault Builder. And we are very happy to be partnering with Snowflake because Snowflake is for us a very important technology that changed the game, how reporting and BI is working, how we can work with databases. And that is part of what we will present here in this webinar. But before we start with this, I would do a short introduction round. And I would start with myself and Anton will uh, introduce himself. And then I hand over to Tino that will do the first part introducing generally what Snowflake is, what the capabilities are, what is the basis and foundation for this kind of process. In the second part, I will introduce first Data Vault Builder for everybody that's new to Data Vault Builder. But very soon I will jump into the whole CI CD and automation topic of deployments and we will explain a little bit why we are so happy to work with Snowflake databases to use their features to automate our deployment pipelines. So my name is Peter Belles. I'm working for Data Vault Builder now since 2010. I'm coming from the consulting part of the company, but back in 2015, we switched over into product development. So my role today is doing technical pre and post sales. I'm working with our partners and our clients to get projects started, but we have a lot of implementation partners. We have a lot of implementation partners, which are also Snowflake implementation partners, which are delivering the whole software suite as a solution to our clients. And I'm here to help you to get started. So I would hand over the word to Anton. Hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Anton Hook. I'm based in Zurich. Uh, I'm working for Snowflake as a sales engineer also coming from consultancy uh, before I've been working quite a lot in the domain of DevOps and such reliability engineering and really happy to answer your questions in the end. Um, but so long, um, over to Tino. Thank you, Anton. And thanks for having me. Um, my name is Tino Bobelas. I'm now two and a half years with Snowflake, also based in Zurich, covering Swiss customers. Before that, I've been uh, 28 years with Oracle as a sales consultant. And uh, after 28 years with Oracle, I <laughs> looked at Snowflake and decided to switch my job. Okay. Back to Peter. Good. So the last thing is, if you have any questions, there is a Q&A button in your Zoom please use that to ask your questions. We will constantly monitoring if there are any questions and if there are any and they fit within the presentation, we will answer them immediately, but most often we will just take it at the end of a, a thematic block to answer it all at once. And there will be a Q&A section at the end where we will go through the question and answer as much as possible. So the first part is from Tino. He will now present what is Snowflake and why it's so great. You see my screen, I guess. Very good. Cool. So if I ask you what is Snowflake, then some of you might say, okay, it's a cloud data warehouse. And you would be right. This is the, the foundation of what we do, but we are much more than that. So I'm gonna introduce you to Snowflake. We're gonna look at one particular feature that uh, Data World Build is very happy to use, which is zero copy, copy cloning. Uh, by the way, uh, uh, Data Vault uh, Builder was the first company I uh, visited when I joined two and a half years ago, and we have a long relation already. I'm very happy with the partner. Good. So, what is Snowflake, other than a data warehouse in the cloud? So, we are the data cloud. We provide a global network. So, we are available globally. I'm gonna tell you already also later on which uh, cloud vendors. And we provide the same service, allowing you to connect to other companies, to your ecosystem. So we're not only 
um, taking care about your own data, your load your data, your organization data. We also enable you to interact, share data with your ecosystem. This might be your customers, your suppliers, and you could have um, data sharing without data movement directly, and you get fresh data immediately without having uh, any uh, complex pipelines. And we also provide um, third party data. So if you're interested in um, financial data, weather data, uh, geographical data, COVID data, we have uh, more than 1,000 data sets available, which you can then integrate with your own data and with the ecosystem data. So we reach out of your organization into other um, layers. And uh, this data then will be made available easily to uh, develop new products, uh, to analyze um, the business, to, to open new revenue streams, make uh, anal analysts and uh, BI users happy um, to provide action. And uh, of course, we want to do this in a governed way. So yes, you can unlock your data, but first you have to know your data. And we provide services like um, data classification. We provide uh, protection stuff like uh, data masking, role-based access control, everything you know you need to protect your data. So this is what Snowflake does in a nutshell. And how we do is we are very fast for any workload. You can run any number or type of jobs across your company and get your data quickly and reliably. We also very fast in onboarding. If you ask me to onboard a new database and provide compute uh, to the end users, I can do this within minutes and you can do this too. So very fast in onboarding new use cases. And, and the biggest difference for me that come from a traditional database world is that we replace manual, uh, manual um, tasks like um, uh, partitioning, indexing, st statistics gathering, backups, um, fiddling with uh, parameters in the database. You don't have to do that. So you are freed of these tasks and this opens you up to provide business value. And among us, there's so much to do in the, in the database world, stuff like um, this data sharing I just showed you or um, data meshes, new concepts to bring in that you, you need this, uh, this free time to look at the, the um, tasks that bring business value. Um, we, you can optimize cost because uh, we are usage-based um, service. So uh, you are charged by the terabytes you're storing compressed uh, and we charge you for the compute by the second you're using and we vary um, quick in starting up and shutting down compute. So you only really charge for that what you're using by the second. And as I said, you make this available then to your end users. And from an architectural view, um, this is the global net. So we are available on AWS, Azure and Google Cloud across the globe. And the service looks and behaves the same on all these cloud vendors. This is also interesting regarding an exit strategy. If you're not content with one provider anymore, you can switch to another one and take your data with you. And the second one is uh, if you if you extending your network, maybe you have new partners, you are on AWS, your partners on Azure, then you still can exchange data very easily, even if you're on different clouds. So we are breaking down silos also in the cloud. And um, then you have your uh, data sources, your input data. It can be databases, IoT, streaming, batch jobs. They land in Snowflake. And on the other side, you have data consumers, BI reporting, um, machine learning, and all the, these things. And the nice thing here is, is what looks a little cloudy uh, is that we are providing the service. You don't have to take care about the technical uh, finer points. You don't see any VMs or, or storage or something. You only see the, the SQL layer uh, and you connect to Snowflake, ask your questions from your Tableau, your Power, uh, uh, Power BI and such and get the answer. And we take care about the rest. 
So the snow grid is this global network that we provide on these cloud vendors globally. We have an intelligent infrastructure. As I said, we are taking over most of the parts of the, of the uh, maintenance. Uh, we call it near zero maintenance. So almost nothing to do. Some customers say, hey, come on, it is zero maintenance. I don't have to do anything any longer. Um, and on top of it, we have the Elastic Performance Engine, which I'm gonna point out in a minute. And you see which use cases we are covering. We started with the data warehouse and then the data engineering. So how do you pipe data into the data warehouse? We can act as your data lake or we can integrate with your data lake. We support data science workloads. Customers are building data applications that have analytical queries built in and data sharing we already mentioned. And the, the, the most important part is these are not like something like modules that you have to buy or something. This is how Snowflake is used by our customers. Okay, about the Elastic Performance Engine. So the Snowflake is not a database that was uh, for 10, 20 years on premise and had been brought to the cloud and uh, cloud washed. So augmented with uh, cloudy look and feel. It was uh, newly created from scratch from a whiteboard. And the inventors, they looked at what the, the, the internet provides like elasticity, uh, low cost and all that. And they built this all in this new product. And what we came up with is the following. We have two major principles in here. One is the, the separation from, of storage from compute. So you can have storage without compute, you can have compute without storage. So, uh, and if you need more compute, you don't have to have more storage and vice versa. So they're totally separate and you only have a single copy of the data and multiple user groups can work on the same data. You don't have to duplicate the data within Snowflake for, for different use cases. Uh, the data is always compressed, always encrypted, so secure. Uh, it is highly available. It's mirrored in the region. And uh, the, the second point is we also then separate compute from compute. So you can then say, okay, I need compute for my ETL pipelines. They will have dedicated compute. Why dedicated? Uh, you remember the good old um, batch windows where you had to shut down um, operations between uh, 11 o'clock till six o'clock in the morning because the batches were running. Huh? You don't have to do this with Snowflake because the batch can load with, with the dedicated compute while end users, BI visualization data scientists are working with the data because they have their own um, dedicated compute. And these green and blue boxes mean they all can get the same data. There's one set of data in the middle. And uh, the nice thing is that uh, let's say this is my production workload today. And now a new use case comes up and says, hey, we want to onboard a finance database with new users. Huh? And I don't have to go there and, uh, and, and think, how do I get more resources out of this? I can simply then create load the data, yes, and then create new uh, compute workers for this new use case, which is, is uh, dedicated to those new use cases. And this can be done within seconds. And as I said, you're charged by the second, you can start it up, shut it down, and are charged accordingly. And uh, this is a SQL database, anti-SQL uh, database, asset compliance. So what you need is SQL knowledge, which is widely available, but we also provide uh, Java, Scala, Python to work uh, with the data. And we have a wide a range of partner tools like Data, Build, uh, data Vault Builder uh, that uh, work with Snowflake. Good. Now let's drill down to the one feature that uh, Data Vault Builder is making use of and is very, <laughs> uh, very, uh, doesn't like very much, zero copy cloning. So if you have a production database but need a development environment and a QA, QA environment, you usually have to duplicate the data, which takes a lot of time. So 
Typically, you only limit yourself to a subset of the data. You pay for more storage and you have to refresh periodically. Um, what we provide is we do uh, metadata, uh, metadata operations. So the, in the metadata, we know this crop database, which database files, we call it micropartitions, belong to this production database. And then you can say, okay, create a clone of the database. And then the development database will point to the same micropartitions, which are unchanged. So this is like a snapshot in time. And uh, what it provides is oh, a, a third one, data science can also point to the same ones. And since this is a metadata operation, uh, the, the time to create a clone is not dependent on the amount of data you're cloning, but you're of, on the amount of metadata you're cloning. So if you only have like 50 tables uh, and, and maybe 300 columns, this takes maybe 30 seconds. If you have 10,000 tables, uh, 5,000 columns each, then it might take one or two or three minutes, but independent on the database size. And uh, what we provide is a simple point to the same files. You do not consume zero additional storage. And of course, unless you change something in these clones, the changes to either database are isolated. So if I change anything in development or data science or in production, they're all independent. They will keep their own delta in their own data files, but they will know, okay, part of this is from production files and part of it is from my files. And we keep order and we know exactly what, what is where. What is very interesting, it is, is extremely granular. You can say, okay, clone a whole database, but you can easily say uh, only a schema or only a table of you, only clone subsets of databases, which makes you more um, versatile. And there's a synergy with another feature often used called time travel. Uh, we can keep the history of data for, for up to 90 days. And you can look back in time and say, what was the state of the data uh, 22 days ago? And the nice thing is you can say, okay, create a clone as it was at the 1st of February <laughs> or January at uh, quarter past two. Uh, this is also great for uh, forensic if you want to find out what people have done to your data. Very good. So this was a short introduction to, to Snowflake. Uh, we're going to have the Q&A at the end. And I would now hand back to Peter. Yeah, thank you. And for us, this feature is really a game changer. It's not only that we like it, it's really allowing us a new work process to introduce in data warehousing that we know from the Java world to really become agile because now we can create sandboxes just with fingersnip. So let me share my screen and we continue with my presentation here. So what is about the data vault builder? The data vault builder is adding a layer on top of Snowflake. It's adding a visual data modeling tool. And it looks a little bit like this here where you create your core business concepts, you model your relations and our tool is converting this in real time into working code. What is working code in the realm of data warehousing? It means database tables. It means load pipelines. It means metadata about these loads. It creates all the necessary master jobs to load these elements. It's creating logging about it. So it's doing everything besides the data modeling. And this helps to bring us the business users back into the data warehousing process. So we work together, IT and business users, we collect their knowledge, which is really, really crucial to build a good data warehouse to understand what the business is about. And it makes it possible because we've simply can show them visually what we are doing. They can correct us, they can help us. And the best thing, it, it helps acceptance at the end because if you build a really great data warehouse and the business users don't understand it, they will continue to use their Excel solutions, which a little bit work, but not always, and create a lot of trouble because they were not involved in the process creating it. And we really can change this whole behavior. And for creating your data warehouse, it reduces your time to market. And it's going down from days 
to hours to maybe even minutes. We have, I think the shortest deployment time that the client has is about 15 minutes from capturing the requirement until they get it on their UIT server. So do we just believe this ourselves? No, we, we let Bart compare our tool to other providers on the market. We have tools from Oracle, Microsoft, and, and other vendors in here. And they came up with the finding that we have the highest customer satisfaction, high recommendation rate going hand in hand. And why is that? Because we have our top in the category time to market. And we will see how this works and why we are achieving that as well. You will see that innovation power, price to value and support quality is as well an important thing with the Data Vault Builder. So why does the Data Vault Builder work so good with Snowflake? We are both, and we heard it before, cloud native. It means the Data Vault Builder was built in the cloud age. It doesn't mean it couldn't run on premises, but it was built that it runs on AWS, it runs on Google Cloud Computing, it runs on Azure, like Snowflake as well. So if you want to move from one platform to the other, you can move it with the whole technology stack. As well, Snowflake is allowing us to loading billion of rows in just minutes. So that's incredible. And it's really, as Tina described it, on the spot, you decide maybe at the end of year, now you need to load 100 million of rows. You turn up your compute power. After that, you dial it back and you pay only during the year for a lower capacity that you need on a daily basis. But then when you need it, just within seconds, you can turn up and turn off uh, the whole power. We are using a lot of virtual layers. So we push a lot of data moving because that's the strength of Snowflake down to the database layer. So we are coordinating, we are orchestrating, but the work of moving the data around is done by the database. We are adding that we can apply, test and deploy stuff within minutes. And what is really cool, we have specialized patterns for Snowflake and we are updating them constantly because the great thing about Snowflake is it's evolving. I mean, we started several years ago and yes, the functionality was limited in the beginning, like with every new product, but it's growing since in a very, very rapid pace. And as well, our patterns to move the data around and how to use the database needs to be changed over time. And we are doing this for our clients. So you care about data modeling and we care about upgrading the usage of how we send commands to the database. So what are we adding? It's about automation. It's if you go into the past of data warehouses, we had this scenario where you could hand code stuff, you could write your SQL manually. And every time that the database offers new feature, you go in and you optimize your solution. So people came up with the finding, let's use some tools for that because it can't be that everybody's doing the same job again and again. So people came up with ETL tools, so like Informatica, sub business objects. And what they did is they did the same just with point and click you are creating a technology as a solution at the technological level. In contrast, automation is about capturing the requirement, maybe washing your hands and generating the technical solution out of it. And this makes it stable over time. And our requirement that we are capturing is the data model, because this is what your business is about. What should be stable in your company, except your business changes, but then anyway, everything changes, so you need to change it. So what is the Data Vault Builder covering? It takes data from the source, it stores it in a persistent layer, and it offers it in an optimal form to your data consumers. And it's having visual interfaces for all of that. And here our green arrow is a little bit longer because usually we can do the staging, but as Tino described as well, we have a lot of Snowflake customers that use the built-in Snowflake staging capabilities and already start the staging process as well with Snowflake and we can pick up the data that is already staged and use ELT processing to go through the different layers. For the more technical people, one a little bit more detailed screen, but that's already it. So what we have in, we pull in the data into our staging area. We have a persistent core with different sub layers for clean data, for not so clean data. And the most important part is because we hear again and again, your data vault is very, very complicated to use in reporting. It's not if you have the proper interfaces and that's what we're creating here. And we have in the meantime, clients that say, yes, we want to have dimensional output. I would say 80 to 90% maybe, 
But we have as well clients saying, no, our reporting tool prefers more a uh, third normal form output. That's fine. We can generate it, even deterministic, completely automatic using our REST APIs. And some other people like, we, we heard the data science people prefer flat tables as well. That's fine. Nobody is accessing here in this solution the core directly. We have always here a virtual interface outputting it. And the cool thing with Snowflake is we can keep it in most cases virtual because the performance is fast enough that we don't need to materialize this kind of calculation, saves you storage, saves you cost at the end, and gives you a really great opportunity to become agile. So what we are adding as well, things like data lineage, like documentation about your implementation, and many more things. I will not go into these details because we have a full length webinar that we will advertise at the end, which shows them really how the Data Vault Builder looks like, how it's used with Snowflake and what the results are. So what is agility about? We, or probably most of us, have seen this picture before. And I always was, oh, okay. Yes, we need to constantly improve and constantly change. Uh, but what does this mean? What is really the requirement? And for me, if I have this small visualization here, I usually say, if these are different features or stories, as me, many people call it, that are developed, can I change my priorities? Can I start developing a feature later and deploy it earlier? Because this is really how I react to market change, how I change to uh, react to change in priorities. If the management decides they want to go for a different strategy, this is how we decide on maybe at the end of year that we need to prioritize some features. And for us, this means we need to be able to do distributed development. This means to develop different features separately. We need to automate regression testing because if I want to create really small feature development or small stories that I develop, I need to completely have automated testing in place. Otherwise, I will not sleep very well because if I deploy every second week as we did it in the past or weekly as most of our clients do or even daily as some of our clients do, then it's not possible to do manual testing. And we need to as well automatically deploy our stuff between the different environments. So this is really the test. If you want to become agile, and you want to have a technical solution supporting that, is it covering this kind of requirements? One example is that is very often used, but it's not the only one, it's just the example. So people are creating business requirements or capturing business requirements in Jira software. They're using Bitbucket or GitHub to store their data models. They use some pipeline automation tools like Jenkins and they are using this already for their Java world. So can we, if we have a company using already this kind of tools or other tools like Azure DevOps may be coming up lately or whatever kind of tools you have, can we integrate with them as well to reproduce the same kind of process that the Java people are doing for the past 15 to 20 years for the data warehousing world? And yes, but we need to take into consideration what we need to do. We need to set up the infrastructure automatically. We need to somehow support the modeling. We need to generate working technical code. We need to take care of automated testing. If we tested everything, taking care of deployment. If we can deploy stuff manually, automated deployment. Then we need to take care of operations. As soon as the stuff is deployed, does auto operations adapt for the new elements that were deployed? And at the end, we need to take care of high availability. And the data vault builder is taking care of all these different steps in the development process. And that's really the difference to other tools that talk about automation, maybe a self-built framework, which is doing good work, but is taking care of one crucial part of the process, but is leaving out the automation of all the other processes. So this means that we are replacing a lot of different tools and a lot of different tools meant in the past as well, that we had a lot of interfaces between them. And now we have one tool we say, but it's one tool plus the database, which is in this case Snowflake, which gives us the power below 
to automatically move the data around with very high speed, having time travel, and as we heard, zero copy cloning, which I will explain in detail why we need that in a second. Next thing is to automate everything is we have a lot of APIs in the tool. So it doesn't matter which kind of tools you're using. By using the Data Vault Builder, you can use it to integrate with your existing environment. But now let's jump into the topic, what we want to automate uh, and why it's working. So the first thing is, usually in the past, if you're working in the data warehousing environment, automation did work like this. We had a model, we pressed the button and the code that was, or the metadata that was stored in the repository was generated on the database. It was generating ETL flows and stuff like that. The problem is that you have now three different elements that you need to somehow sync and maintain and becomes really complicated because the models need to be always stored in the repository and the repository needs to deploy to the repository and then to the database. And in the data vault builder, we remove the repository from the equation. And this gives us the fast time to market. This means if you're modeling in the data vault builder in one environment, a new element in the same second, it's created on Snowflake. And the great thing is, as it's on, in the same second on Snowflake, it can be tested, it can be loaded with data and the data vault builder loads it with data immediately. So this speeds up the development process. As well, it simplifies the deployment because now we can take every single object that we model and deploy it to other environments using a fully ITIL conform deployment path. And in the target, it will be recognized, it will put, be put in the master job automatically, stuff like that. So now, how do we build a CI-CD pipeline with all these tools? The first thing is we need to automate an environment setup. So if we decide that we want to go from production to pre-production, and I have taken this example because this is quite famous, most people have heard of it or done it even themselves. If you want to test your deployments before you go into production, you want to test your script. So you need to create a pre-production script. With classical databases, you would have several servers. You take a backup, maybe a few hours. You restore the backup on another server, other few hours, and then you can deploy your tests. And if they fail, it's the next day that you continue. In Snowflake, you type in one command and it's copied automatically. Maybe, yes, I wouldn't say it's always a few seconds, but uh, if we talk about a few minutes, yes, so far it worked always in a few minutes and it's a difference uh, if I have a day or just two minutes to copy or clone the database, it really impacts how you can work. There's maybe a second SQL command where you need to grant permissions and there maybe that was what Dino meant. It's not zero, zero. Uh, you don't need to don't need any DBAs because you need to set permissions, but that's not something technical. That's uh, how you authorize people that you still need, but that's not something that they could take away from you. All the index creation and all the optimization in partitions, that's all the stuff that you don't need to do anymore. You just type one command, it's copied and it's done. The same is for the data vault builder. The data vault builder uses a technique called Docker deployment, which is delivered as virtual containers. So if you want to set up a new environment, you just need a configuration command and it will start up, fire up a new environment. As the data vault builder doesn't persist any data because that's all in your database, it doesn't need to copy any data. You just start a new environment. It connects to the clone of your existing database and it's immediately ready that you can work with it. So this takes a few minutes and you're good to go. Now, but we have a different requirement for distributed development. And this is again, my example case with the cars, but now a little bit more technical. So if you are working in Git, we can do something called branches. These are different lines of states that we are storing in our uh, Git repository. And for every feature that we are developing, we will create first a so-called branch. And in, for every branch you're working on, we need something when you're coming from the Java world called a working folder. It means one place where we work on this element and we are adding, changing stuff, maybe deleting stuff. And this kind 
of branches need a working folder, which consists of one Snowflake database and the data vault folder. And that's exactly why we're using the same process to clone your integrated development box to create a sandbox. And if you now tell me, yeah, but we never used sandboxing in data warehousing. I agree with you because it was not possible in the past to do that at all. Because if I'm on existing on-prem databases, if I would need to copy the full production data set for 10 developers, it, the cost would run terribly high. Here, really, as I'm not paying for the unmodified data, I can really, even if I have a team of 10 or 20 people, give everyone a sandbox. I just need a small Linux server where the data vault builder is running on, which can be on-prem or in the cloud, or it can be Kubernetes cluster somewhere where just the software runs and connects then to the sandbox databases. Yes, for the change data, you will pay for the storage, but it's not a problem because for before you start every feature, you throw away your existing database, you clone anyway, you're integrated development, you're again on the baseline and you develop against this baseline. In the other direction, we use automatic deployment. And that's a feature that now the data vault builder is adding to bring the distributed development together again. So how does this look like? We have a lot of different environments. They consist all of a Snowflake database. They all consist as well of a data vault builder. We have the logo here, so I don't have repeated it everywhere. So imagine we start here with one state in the integrated development and we use for all our versioning Git. Can become in all the flavors that Git has, but now let's create a branch. Developer A starts developing a feature. Now the management decides that it's not that important. We need to do something else much faster. So another developer creates another branch, goes into his sandbox, develops the feature that is really urgently required and is able to merge it back into integrated dev. Even this developer is still working on his code. Imagine that in the past, because usually you would now need to wait that this developer as well merges stuff back or unlock stuff here that you can merge the stuff together. And that's not the case anymore. It's completely independent. Git is able to do this kind of logic for you. And then we deploy this stuff and only when maybe this is already in production, the other developer decides that he finished his feature and put it back into integrated dev. And this is really agility. And only if you achieve this, then you're ready to do really with bigger teams distribute the development. And what do we need? How does this look like in the data vault builder? So imagine that one developer develops this part of the model, the other one develops this part of the model, you say that both have created one element which they have in common. Now, both of them check in their changes on their specific branches into Git repository, and then you can merge them. And we are using classical Git merging. This means you can use any Git tools that you're already using. We have clients using source tree, Tortoise Git, or the Git command line client to merge the different models together and to create one integrated model. By the way, this what I'm showing here is an example of a workshop that we did with four different teams that never used the data vault builder before. In a three hours exercise, we gave them all their sandboxes, we gave them tasks, developed their own features, and at the end we merged it together and worked perfectly. And we were able to create our first report on day one. So if this automatic merging is working, what's the next step? It's regression testing. And you really need to think early about this and how can this look like is that you have several tests, they run automatically, you change your data model until everything works again and then you get green feedback. And what are the steps for that? Usually your CI CD server, it can be Jenkins, it can be Azure DevOps, whatever you like to use. It's usually starting a new environment. So it's copying using zero copy cloning a Snowflake database, which can be like a baseline state because you can clone as well at certain times, which is really cool. So you can clone exactly one state that you know you ex where you know what your asserts are, what your expected results are for the tests. Then as the data vault builder has REST APIs, you can pull 
the defined state from Git that you want to test. You deploy it using the REST API through the Data Vault Builder. So it's in fact just one or two REST API calls. Then you start your loads using the REST API. Then you wait until the data is loaded. You get the results back either through the database or through the REST APIs. We are using their tools like Postman or uh, J, uh, JMeter to test everything and get the results back in a format which is corresponding to JUnit tests. And we can validate that everything succeeded. And this is highly automatable. So, so we can run tests in parallel. We are doing this usually as soon somebody creates a so-called pull request. A pull request is a request to merge my code back into like the integrated development pipeline. So I work on my feature. I do different versions. I do different tests. And when I'm happy, then I do a so-called pull request. And we can automate based on that, that somebody has requested to his code or his model to be merged back into the integrated development that all this test start and it will validate everything in the Git repository. And then your colleague will get a message and say, hey, somebody requested that it's merged. I have tested it. I validated it with regression testing. Everything is green. Yes, there could be new issues, but everything which was regression tested is okay. Now review it manually and check it in that it's merged together. If you take this further, then the full process will look like at the end that somebody starts development. So he will create a sandbox, uh, create a uh, branch in Git. He will start a sandbox. Then we will develop the feature. Then he will publish his feature by committing and pushing it into a central repository. Then there is the validation step, what I explained one step before. Then we're deploying this to your development environment. If everything's working there and the technical tests were successful for several days, then you go into your test slash UIT environment where you have then some manual confirmation by the business user, probably a sign off process, and you deploy everything to production. And if you would do this manually, then you can do maybe three or four releases per year, but here it's supported. Starting the development is supported by the data vault builder and always a Snowflake database. Then you develop, your developer is working with the data vault builder against specific Snowflake database. Then we're publish publishing the stuff. The data vault builder is taking care of delivering everything to check it into Git repository and providing the REST APIs to automate that. Validation can be done completely automatic. Deploy to development also, deploy to test also. Then we have one more manual step. That's the confirmation because here the business user needs to do some testing for the new cases. He will sign off the new features and then we can deploy everything to production again automatic. And this allows us to go through the different step very, very fast. For sure, I've missed out stuff here like that you need to update your test from time to time and stuff like that. So it's not like it's coming for free, but it saves you a lot of cost in the long run by automating this pipeline. So you can really go through all the steps with every feature that you have. And that was already the basic explanation what we are offering how we are working. Important for us is that we really can clone the Snowflake databases to get a sandbox because we haven't found any other database that is capable to do this kind of functionality today. In this speed, at this cost, it's just not possible. So I would say that, that we look at the questions, there are quite some, Anton. I don't know if you have already read any, if you want to answer any of them. I would say that we have maybe a few seconds to read through. I would launch a small poll so you can answer if you're already using any CI CD means, if you heard of this kind of stuff, or if this is new for you and you're just interested of how this could work and what are the possibilities. Yeah, so I already answered some of uh, the one other question, but I think the first one, uh, Peter, which is still unanswered is for you. So maybe you take it in the same context. Good. So what is the pricing model for Data Vault Bill and is there a trial we can try? Okay, so what we do is we orient, uh, orient ourselves 
on the Snowflake model. So based on the load uh, on the compute warehouse that you use to load your data, what the sizing is there will determine what the sizing of the data vault builder license is. And the second aspect that we have is the number of developers, because the bigger the teams, the more questions we get, the more support we need to offer and stuff like that. So if you can give us these two numbers, so what is the load warehouse? Because we don't care about, you know, maybe in Snowflake, you can, as Tino mentioned, separate your compute warehouses like for different tasks for loading the data or querying it. So we don't care about how much power you put into querying your data, that's your thing. It's just only about loading the data. And this usually is determined in how much data do you have, how fast do you need lo load it, and how many, how much data changes per day. And this gives you then the sizing of your load warehouse. And this will determine then the, the license cost. Just to, to give you a basic idea, we start at very low prices already for smaller companies that are that's very affordable. We have mid sized licenses for most of our clients, maybe with teams, maybe with maybe five or six developers that were before they used the data vault builder, maybe 10 or 12 people. And then we have really huge clients with multi-tenancy options with several production servers that that's the third. So th these are three different sizes. So if you can indicate us a little bit, then we can send you a tailored uh, offer for you. Good, so next question. Assuming that you don't use normal commons, create database clone, yeah. Let, let me take it this one. I was just about uh, to type it. So it's a, it's a, uh, it's a set technical. of different questions. Okay, good. Uh, <laughs> so, um, happy, happy, um, thanks for, for the, for the question. Uh, the questions is, uh, to give you a bit more context to all the audience here. It's about, uh, about a special time travel behavior that, that, um, Will is experiencing in Snowflake. Um, I mean, the, the smallest high level view on this, um, is that you cannot time travel beyond the creation time of an object. Um, so just imagine that, um, so this is a very special behavior. Um, it's not a malfunction, sorry to say it, it like this, Will. Um, I'm proposing to have a chat on this personally, but it's just basically that you, of course, cannot travel before an object has been actually created. Um, um, yeah, maybe you can share anything about your time travel behavior, Petra. Um, so to give in a voice, which is maybe outside of Snowflake directly, uh, what was your um, experience so far with time travel? So what we use time travel for is like creating snapshots at specific points in time. And we need this often like a, a, as a baseline, because if I do testing, I need to know as well the results of my tests usually that I can do automated regression testing. So we can like do snapshots at end of a month or something or before some changes were done. And that's our baseline. Then we do our changes and we compare against how the data was before, how it's after and for that, that it's very handy. Sometimes we have as well clients that want to do simple reports, but still need to offer reporting exactly as it was, was end of the month, the month before and stuff like that. For that, it's really, really cool because you can, yes, with the data vault builder, we are creating a full business his, uh, history of your data and everything, doing STD type two output if you want, but this makes reports much more complicated because, because they contain much more information. So if you just want to do a simple version, like as you did maybe before you had your click report and you saved it every end of the month, you can do like the same behavior by using snapshots at specific times. And I think that's really cool. I haven't seen that elsewhere as well. And sometimes if I messed up with some stuff, I already used time travel to restore the stuff I deleted by accident. <laughs> yeah. So this, this, comes, this, this um, feature comes out of the box with um, uh, to hire um, uh, series and snowflake, uh, which I can set up up to 90 days of time travel. So if it comes to reporting and for example, you just need a specific snapshot of a given, as you said, on a given point in time, um, you, you can get it. Um, and yeah, just pay attention. We had only one trouble, but that's not a snowflake problem. It's I think with the demo account, it's only one day. So if you're used to working on your enterprise client and you show for somebody else that he can time travel <laughs> further on the demo accounts, it's, but that's described in, in, in the documentation. So it's not a bug, it's really as, as it should be. 
Good. There is one more question. Is data wall builder being used in enterprise great clients? Yes, it is. We have like a European space agency or the Deutsche Bahn, which are using this kind of software with the uh, with really huge uh, installations. We have installations with several thousand of objects, several hundred of core objects or core business concept. We have clients loading on Snowflake several uh, billion of rows into their core of machine data. And it's working out of the box, but that's uh, with loading really billion of rows. It's not a thing of the data vault builder. We are coordinating, we're sending the right commands. The data processing is done by Snowflake and that's why it's working so well together because yes, if I'm using it on other databases, then I will hit at some point the limits of the system I'm using. And here I can say, yes, I need some more performance between two o'clock in the morning and four o'clock in the morning to load my machine data batch from yesterday. That's okay. And after that, I turn off this higher grade load warehouse again. Yeah, and there's also another question in the chat itself. Um, so it's about the permission model. Is the permission model include on data vault? Uh, I mean, all access role or specific role must be linked to clone or other objects you need to build. So in fact, as we are not persisting any data at rest in the data vault builder, all the permissions for like the report users and stuff like that is done on the database level. So it's done, we are creating database objects and you can permission them as you did in the past. You can do role level security if you need them for your report users. For developers, we have four different roles to use in the tool, which are a normal developer, administrator, read-only user and operations user. So you can already differentiate on the base on, of interfaces they can use in the tool. But we can link as well our users to database users. This means that you can link then as well the database users to your principal AD or what you're using. And then you can even just use with the same credentials, use the data vault builder. As soon as the person loses database access, he loses as well access to the data vault builder. So there is not like a hole in between that he could continue accessing the database through the tool or stuff like that. And the next, I think that the related question would be in the Q and A in this time. So uh, I assume that you code access rights in the vault builder. Um, no, that's really we leave that permission thing up on the database level. So to to the because usually that's not the in bigger companies that's usually not the same team, the modelers and and data warehouse people and the people administrating. As you, as you see again, but I mean, with administrating, really giving the permissions to different parts and stuff like that on Snowflake. Mm -hmm. And other objects written in imperative or declarative form? Uh, you model them. So, the model. Mm -hmm. in fact, I would say 90, 95% of the objects in the data vault builder are really derived from the data model as well, data loads all the job control is everything derived from the model there where you write really manual stuff is in the business rules section where you can formulate business rules in snowflake sql dialect so you can use the full power of snowflake to define everything that needs to be done pivoting unpivoting reading json from variant file variant columns and stuff like that that's the power that you can use then in the business rule section which is coded in sql because yes that's the language most people know about. Maybe one interesting question as well for you, Anton. If I'm already having an on-prem data warehouse, why would I move to Snowflake? That's a, that's a tricky one. And you know, uh, it's, it's depending on the use case and on the, and the, on the requirements um, or the experience that you had with the, um, with the warehouse. Uh, usually what what we uh what we hear mo more the most is um the way how it's actually working in terms of simplicity um so the simplicity of not the need to care a lot about my compute resources about my compute resource up front to having the um the risk of being over provisioned or under provisioned at some point in time the same of not being limited in any uh, direction in terms of space um and being being able to also scale with the with the com uh, with the company as it grows or it, it's um or the usage is growing so these are some some 
super important pieces which i'm um, facing almost every day people saying how can we make our delivery layer of in in our data mars for example making them able to scale with with the requirements that we have in terms of people um and that's and that's just uh, unique i think in giving them the way to start up in a matter of a second and then shutting down again and then saving the time for example during some off seasons maybe i can say tell a little bit for, from our clients why they are doing it sometimes they have end of life sometimes they have really high costs on their existing systems and currently we had several cases where they needed to decide for to buy new hardware to extend their existing databases and it was not like only the cost today but the delivery time for new services like months right now in certain areas so they needed to decide or oh, can we afford to wait three six or even nine months or don't know when we get the new hardware or we are on a database where we just load more data and it's working because somebody else took care of the capacity planning they can take care in an absolutely different way of, of capacity planning by, by preparing capacity that will be used in the future. And I can grow really piece by piece and I don't need to like buy chunks for the next step because I need to plan for the next few years and stuff like that. So, so that's really important points. And yes, the second thing is administration. There are databases on-prem that work really great if you have really great admins. And here really you can get a lot of power out of it just by using the database. That's really cool. Good. So we have the as last thing, maybe the result from our CI CD poll. Uh, I can share the results. So most of the people are already using agile approaches. They're using a Git based process. So, so the adaptation of Git is much, much higher than as we did this, the same question about one year ago. And already the first people are using any form of CI CD automation, which is really cool because I think two years ago, nobody knew what we were talking about. One year ago, it started taking up and especially since our version six, where we really offer now rest APIs as well for really everything that you just can with one rest call download models, upload models, compare models, get results in JUnit for format if the deployment was working, stuff like that. It really picked up as well with our existing clients, which I'm very happy about because I think that's the way forward. Because yes, there is a lot of data and the change speed of the structures and everything is speeding up the whole time. And we need to somehow cope with that and really stay agile to get ahead of it. Anton, do you have any few last words before we finish the webinar today? Yeah, I think you have you have an, another slide attached, so just just oh. for your awareness. So, um, yeah, um, there was there was always a chance for you to get a free trial with Snowflake if you just want to um, play around. Uh, we do have a thirty days free trial, which offering you around four hundred dollars of free credits to try out, for example, Data Vault Builder or any anything else that you would like to try out like time travel or zero copy clone um, and in addition to this to the free trial we do have a quick start so it's really a step-by-step -step, hands-on guide how to use snowflake uh, we do have zero to snowflake but also around 40 different um, uh, quick start guides i'm sorry the link is blue on blue um, but you can find it um, online and it's actually like machine learning on snowflake is also it's a step-by-step -step guide um, feel free to shout out. Um, I'm happy to, for any questions that follow up that, that you didn't remember, um, add me on LinkedIn, write me an email. Um, it's my first name, last name at snowflake.com with a dot in between, right? Um, yeah. Thanks a lot for Petters for, for hosting. Uh, it was a pleasure. Okay. So last thing as well, from my side, we have a special webinar where we show how Snowflake and Data Vault Builder works really by going step by step through the different layer, creating objects, creating a first report within this webinar and showing you how it works, how agile changes work. And to answer the question, can I try it out? Our usual step is join our webinar, then you will see a lot of the stuff that it's able to do. The second step is usually that we offer you to do a co-modeling session where we help really if you bring some data that you know to show how to work with the data because the data vault builder to use, yeah, it's as easy as it gets, but still, as you have seen how many 
different features we cover to get into the data vault builder it's better than if somebody helps you we have a lot of partners helping you with that but as well we help our potential clients to get started in the first two or three hours after that you get the hang of it but it's much much simpler to start like that so please contact us as anton was saying contact me on linkedin join our webinars and we will find a way that, that you get what you need to test our software out i thank you a lot thank you for all the attention that we had today and looking forward to seeing you anton in person hopefully in the next weeks <laughs> again thank you, thank you. bye Bye-bye.